legends of the dance floor of the dance floor a piece of paradise of paradise Larry LeVan story whatever happened story. to the day we met on King Street all we ever wanted to do is sing and dance hey yeah maybe we could go back there and look for King Street but sad as it may be people we never got the chance of Whatever happened to the days we met on King Street? Good evening and welcome to Legend of the Dance Floor, a piece of paradise. Let's thank Larry Levan, it's Friday. We have five interviews from people close to Larry, including DJ Manny Lehman, Michael DeBenedictus from the Peach Boys, Bobby Vitteridi from Trocadero Transfer, Brian Chin, and the legendary Rochelle Fleming from First Choice. So let's go to LA to hear Eddie Gordon interview Manny Lehman. My name is Manny Lehman, and I used to work at a little record store in New York called Vinyl Mania in Greenwich Village, which was a haven from every facet of music of DJs. Larry was a great DJ. Sometimes he would do clanking mixes because he was playing on thorns, not on 12 hundreds, not on CDJs. He was playing on thorns for the best sound quality possible. But he knew how to slip through a beat like nobody's business. You were peeking to one song in one second, and then you were peeking to another one in another, and you were like, oh my god, how did he, how did we get that? He was a great DJ, and he manipulated sound with the crossover systems that Richie Long had built there. He manipulated sound like no one I've heard ever since and after. I've never heard anything like it. There was an art form to that shit. The, the tweaking of the bass and the hi-hats and, and keeping the bass out for a full minute. And then when the, when the most important phrase of the song came in, he would emphasize it with the bass. Un unparalleled still to this day. I found the garage first. I, I went, I first went to the garage in 1978 and it changed my life. I never had heard sound like that or seen enthusiasm from an audience as I had there. It, it was like nothing you've ever seen before. People were singing back, you would turn off the music, people would sing and, and people would jam to a song they knew well, like that. They would play Shaka Khan, I'm Every Woman and every single person in there was singing along like it was fun, not like, oh, I'm over this song, or this song is too old. Nothing was too old as long as it was played in contact. And from that place, I got familiar with the owners of Vinyl Mania, and they knew I had a, a musical connection to the garage, and they thought they could use my insight to the music and, and my knowledge of the music, where people would come in and say, do you have a song that goes like this, that, 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 and I would say, oh, that's blah, blah, blah. They knew they could incorporate that into their already successful business because of their location. And I, I went there and, and joined the team, and it was, it was magic. It was, it was really magic. That, it was the garage first, but that insight to that music led me to Vinyl Mania. And then Vinyl Mania, in turn, allowed me to give back to Larry and to the garage and saying, hey, I got a couple cute new releases. Come check this out, Larry. He would come to the store and I'd play him the song. He'd go, no, yes, give me two of those, yes. Yeah. And then he would leave and everybody would be like, oh my God, what did he buy? What did he buy? I said, sorry, I only had one copy of each. You know, and, and sometimes I would flip the song he said no to in the bag and he ended up playing it and I'd be like, okay, I told you so, okay? No, but it was, uh, it, it was amazing, the, the, the relationship with him and, and a lot of other DJs. You don't, you can't possibly get that now when you can't walk into a store and, and talk to somebody or say, hey, look at this, look, the people are asking about it. Now it's all about, you know, yourself and kind of a screen, a commune of people that would just get together and, and congregate for music. You would get the most random songs, like, you know, E2E4, which was one whole album, two sides of music, but he would play the whole album. You would never expect to hear that in a club. Play that in a club now, people would be like, this person's like crack. But back then, you know, you went in a different BPM tempo where you could play E2E4 for, for 30 minutes, and then go into Ain't Nobody by Shaka Khan, and then go into down to low time by the originals. And everybody would go with every tempo chain. Friday afternoons of Vinyl Man, let me tell you, was the equivalent of a nightclub. It would start 
at 3 o'clock to we close at 11. And uh, all I needed was to serve cocktails behind the counter. Everybody was there for what the newest release was, what the newest bootleg was, what the newest independent song was, and what were the hot imports. Like nothing you've ever seen before and since. And there would be Hex Hector, Francois Kevorkian, or Mark Kamen, of course Larry and Timmy Regisford, any of any given genre, Justin Strauss, you know, the name goes on, the names go on and on to see the fan and the celebrity congregate in a common era. Back then, you know, the buzz started. Timmy would go out BLS and play these amazing songs for three or four months. Like Colonel Abrams, Trapped, and Music is the Answer. You would hear these songs three or four months, maybe six months, maybe sometimes even a year before they came out and created such a frenzy for these things on the underground that these kids would come in every, at least once a week and say, is um, Ain't No Man High Enough by Inner Life released yet? No, it's not out yet. When is it coming? We don't know. You know, is Padlock by Glenn Guthrie out yet? No, not yet. You know, maybe someday soon, but we don't know what the hell's going on legally with that stuff. But it, it, it was because they gave him the opportunity that Timmy and Boy Jarvis and Tony Humphreys and Bruce Forrest, they would all, like, they had the WBLS format and they would, they wouldn't play commercial stuff that everybody knew. He had an amazing aptitude for music selection. You know, he would play songs, not to just play a song, but to a purpose or to peak a crowd or to, like, get everybody in the funk zone. But cutting from the DJ factor, he also had such a prolific remix. He will, and Shep Pettibone at the time were the cats that you went to for a remix. You know, Larry LeVan did so many amazing remixes that all he had to do was play his remixes back to back and work through them, period. You know, kind of. He also had his musical taste and selection was eclectic and energetic. And that, that's the only way to say it. He would play, you know, Mick Jagger, Lucky in Love, and the Tom Tom Club, and Madonna, D Train. You know, it's like three or four songs that are not connected in any way, but it would make sense there because, first of all, the sound system in there was sick. The sound system in, in there was something to be beheld. I wish that we had a parallel to that now, but we don't. How cool a club is, I don't care how great they say the sound system is, there was nothing compared to that. Because that was Richard Long's showroom. He built that place to sell sound systems. To say, oh, come on over. So it was a show, sonically. And then, aesthetically, it was a get down club. It wasn't over glitz, there wasn't too many lights. It was just enough to give you the, the vibe and, and the energy with the strobes. It wasn't over, it was about the sound and the music. And then he had a clientele that was more kind of like street. You know, it was a, 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 people went up there to be poshing and standing up, you know, posing. They were there to get down. So when you play Love is the Message, it was a whole different experience. People were there to bear their soul, release the tension, and just show that they could dance. It was, it was a showroom for the dancer. It wasn't about what outfit you had on. Which Madonna record did he was in his repertoire? He played everybody. Everybody. He played that song to death. And this is before anybody knew who Madonna was, obviously. And before anybody knew she was a white girl. Because when Madonna's single first came out, they said, Oh, who's this girl? She, she black? You know, nobody knew that she was white at first. So she came out with the little, you know, video to that. But, but he would play everybody. He played Holiday. Mm -hmm. After that, you know, when, she, when Madonna became a little more mainstream, maybe he backed away from it a little bit. I partied with Madonna many times at the garage and watched people have a great time in a different way, you know. Overall, everywhere played had tempo changes. Whether it was The Saint, Studio 54, The Garage, Xenon, Starship, whatever the hell the club was, you danced from 100 BPMs to 140 BPMs. But it was the, the how, the style of music that you filled it in with. Larry played more funk, eclectic stuff, really high energy R&B, and The Saint was more um, high energy, prettier music, um, which, you know, which more symphonic and more, I won't say dramatic, just, just a different kind of drama. We want to put that in pressure because you must have, at some point, you must have seen a crossover in vinyl like when you started to sell hit, these hip hop records. Yes. But they had these huge disco breaks all over. Yes. Can you just rewind a little bit to that? Uh, how that, that kind that, of evolved? That's a, that's a good point and something I haven't really thought through. 
in, in my head, but um, obviously, you know, rappers delight good times, you know, that's a history 101 of music. When hip hop first started getting popular in the streets, they would scratch songs that were popular in discos, like the Incredible Bongo Band, and It's Just Begun, and they would take, a, you know, a one minute break of a song and physically switch it back and forth, and, and they created a whole new vibe with these things. And then all of a sudden, the, these hip hop songs, these underground, on independent labels also started coming out, Eric Green and Rakim, and, and all that stuff, and, and they would sample Herb Albert songs, or, or Isaac Hayes songs, and all these disco symphonic songs that would take the break of these songs and create these amazing pieces of music. But one record we all talked about, and I know you were one of them who sold it, so well, Liquid Optimal Cow. Optimal, yeah. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah, Optimo, but a little bit. Like work the crap out of it. And it was an instrumental random funk track. And it, of course, it ended up being White Lines. That, that bass line is, you hear the original, you're like, oh my god, it's a direct crossover lift, you know? But that's what, that's, that's a good one. That's that's a very appropriate one. ESG Moody yeah. and Liquid come from the same label. 99 Records. Correct, the same era. Right. Both of them have their own story. Right. ESG was a huge record. In the garage. And ESG was a huge record at the garage. Probably bigger than life that yeah. it, was, it was huge at the garage and at Better Days and all those clubs like that. The song Optimal Cabo by Liquid Liquid on 99 Records, it, it, it had this impact at the garage with the house heads. Because of the deep, the deep bass line and the, the relentless do 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 that just keeps going and going. And you don't know where it's going to go, but it just keeps pumping and pumping. And then the B-Boys found it. The boys that went to the fun house and listened to Jelly Bean and all that stuff. It crossed over from the dark downtown movie house thing to the B-Boy thing. There, it went on to the hip-hop thing where they were, sound, they were scratching it up and starting to rap over the shit. It ended up being White Lines. That, tra that underground track was so strong that it transcended all the genres. It created a genre within itself. I remember hearing the, the 79 Good Time, uh, Rappers of Life, the first time. Yes. And by using that bed, they, they gave themselves an instant platform mm -hmm. for, for accessibility to radio. I remember when um, Rappers Delight first came out, and I was, it was the first commercially available rap song, but it took something that was so already embedded into pop culture. Good Times had already been a number one song for a month. Chic was in everybody's household. In that year. Everybody knew who Chic was. And then someone had the audacity to create a song with that. It was like, well, wait a minute. This has been done already, but you never heard that before. You know, samples can can be can can vary from offensive to creative to we're like, oh my god, I would never have imagined that as a loop, you know. And but but they did that so right. They just took the right amount of music of it, just a couple of bars, and created and structured a whole thing around it. And and, and it was and, and to this day, I mean, you play that anywhere and it gets just as, it gets a bigger response than if you play good times you know what i think about i can't wait by new shoes he bought that import from me friday afternoon he took two copies and, and played it all weekend long because you know when larry liked the new song you didn't hear it once you heard it for two hours and that's one of the songs where i can say there was a direct connect where he sold it to him he played it, Atlantic picked it up, and it ended up being a number one song. Like when he would come to Vinyl Mania, he would hang up in this little space behind the counter next to me for hours, answering questions, talking to people. He was never rude to people, he would always have a smile on his face. But when he was working, and he was working with a crowd, you should let him work. Because that man was working, bro. He was focused. The next interview is with Michael DeBenedictus from the Peach Boys. I'm assisted by my close friend Mike Marin on Larry Levan, the formation of the Peach Boys, and all the magic that went on in the garage. So let's go to Michael and hear his story. The first record that I did with him was Heartbeat. That was uh, when we went to the studio and I did overdubs. When he was, he used to go mix records. Uh, the edge that he got by having a live musician with him was that now he could make it even more of a Larry record because it was, he had a keyboard player that would play parts. And emphasize the parts that he... Well, yeah, 
they were his, you know, it was like we were his crew. The beginning of Michael the Benedict is coming to the garage. I worked there doing lights. There was a siren in the booth, in the board, and he was playing a record, and I turned the siren on, peaked the record, and the siren was out of tune with the record. So I stopped, you know, I didn't get to the pitch of the record, it was like flat. He was like, oh, that's awful. I said, gee, I wish I could tune that siren. And my next thought was, a synthesizer I can tune. So I went over to Larry right away, it was like in instant impulse. And I said, Larry, I'm gonna bring my synthesizer tomorrow so I can make a tough siren match this record. Because the one I just did, it was out of tune. And he knew right away what I meant was out of tune, it didn't sound right. But I could tune the record. I could tune the, the set. So the next night I brought the synthesizer basically to make sirens and sound effects. And then as we got comfortable with it, then it was like play bass lines. Then it was like play leads. And that was a monophonic synthesizer, which meant that you could only play one note at a time. Basically, I did all that in the booth. And what kind of synthesizer was that? That's called an ARP Odyssey. Then we did Heartbeat, and uh, I got a profit because you know, we were poor at that time. And so uh, then I brought the synthesizer to the club, and I was on the dance floor because there's too much equipment now in the booth. So they had this uh, sound booth that the guys that did live shows, they put the mixing board and all that stuff in this booth. So we dragged that out in the middle of the dance floor, and I hooked up three synthesizers. Which were? Um, the Arp Odyssey, a Prophet 5, and an Oberheim. And I sent the signal to him the same way the live I sound guy sent Larry the signal, so it was already hooked up, nothing had to be rewired. And I would play, and when he liked what he heard, he'd put it in the mix. And we did that for a good six months. He got to see how people uh, reacted to sounds, reacted to lines. Uh, sometimes he would shut everything off, and I'd play a song that we were working on, like a line. Uh, and song On a Journey came from that. So you get a real good response from the audience immediately when you're playing in front of them. If they like it, they'll react. If they don't, they'll, you know, head for the doors. And that was uh, how we started playing live. And then it became a, you know, gimmick. It was like, oh my God, there's a keyboard player. So then Robert would bring his guitar, you know, and people would be just like, what is this? And that's, for me, uh, the term house music. That's really how it came to be. You could only hear that in our house. You couldn't hear it anywhere else, no matter what club you went to. If you didn't have Larry and me and this guy and that guy, Larry you didn't have that version of the song. And that's the genesis of house music. Tell us about a bit about Heartbeat. How did that all happen? West End was the label. Ken Nix was the producer. They had asked Larry to do an overdub. Larry said, we got this record. He brought the record to the club. Uh, he played it. And one of the interesting things about that kind of record, and prior to that, all the records were, especially records from Europe, they were all synthesized, sequenced, drum machines, so they were all in perfect beat, perfect pitch. There was no, you know, no human feel, so to speak. And here comes the long heartbeat, which is a lot slower than typical records at the time. And it was out of tune, the drums slowed down. So all of a sudden, those things became fresh. Because the record's out of tune, but that's fresh compared to all the rest of the stuff that you're hearing on the radio where it's perfect digital pitches. Now you've got a record that's fresh because it's out of tune and out of time. So we went to the studio, and if he liked what I played, he'd say, there, yeah, that, play, do that. And then from there, it would expand. Oh, no, it's too much. Da -da -da -da. Yeah, exactly, that melody. Yeah. Da -da -da -da, do that. And da -da -da -da. And, oh, yeah, 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 that. That sound is the Prophet 5. That was a new polyphonic synthesizer that had just been released, so every keyboard player wanted to have that. And I was no different, just a fabulous synthesizer. And as a result of that session, uh, West End said, how do you want to get paid? And I said, I want you to buy me a Prophet 5. How much did that cost back then? It was 2,500 bucks. Right. It's probably like six or seven written now. Uh, no credit, no you know, royalty, not buying synthesizer. And from that came a lot of other records, so that was a good investment. And we were on West End for a while. So, I could have had one of everything I would have, but there was an art odyssey in the studio when we did Make It Last Forever. I mean, in the, the mini loop, so I played the bass on that because that had a great bass sound yeah. from uh, Make It Last Forever. Just out of curiosity, what kind of drum machines were you guys using back then? Uh, we had a Lindrum and an Oberheim DMX. The Lindrum was the first programmable drum machine, or like the Roland. Um, and it was, uh, sam they were all, these were samples. Prior, like all of the rolling drum machines and like the ones that you get in Hammond, Oregon from the 70s, they were all assimilations of drum sounds, but they were all created by synthesizers. So a bass drum wasn't really a, a, the sound of a bass drum. The Lindrum came out and it was actual recordings of parts 
so that you could recreate the sound of a real drum set, but use it in a machine. So we used the real drum machine. That's the other, the Oberheim was a kind of combination of synthesized sounds and real sounds. After that, songs by uh, like Arthur Baker, um, they used the role in 808 in uh, <coughs> Rocker's Revenge. So they really capitalized on that electronic sound of the drums. Was Larry um, a hands-on person when it came to, as far as programming, I guess, like the structure of the songs? Yeah, he would say when the changes should come. Life is Something Special was a, we were supposed to copy um, da -da -da -da, Jungle Fever. Uh -huh. da -da 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 -da. First of all, my feeling about original uh, material is that nothing is original. Right. Uh, what makes something original is the creator. Right. Um, my input, my physical, my emotional and intellectual application to the music is how I put my mark on it. But after people like Bach and Beethoven and Mozart, all the combinations were already done. So you had changes in technology, you had changes in taste. So you really didn't have to have changes in um, musical content because it had already been done before. So all of the parts that are in this record or that record, um, kids today will play a record and I'll say, that's craft work. And I'll play the original and they'll go, oh wow, isn't that true? Yeah. One of the things about the guitar player in the Peach Boys was, uh, he was a rock and roll guitar player. Power chords were, he, he, that's what I loved about him. He could play solos and make that guitar scream and cry, like Jeff Beck, like Eric Clapton, yeah. So when you, you come to a player like myself, and I think of myself as a funk, rhythmical player, um, who didn't have loud synthesizers when I was coming up in music. It was all Fender Rhodes, um, no, <laughs> I never had a loud guitar. So I was never able to solo live until I had a synthesizer. And so Robert coming to this kind of music and me going to him made a great, you know, a, a new approach to the kind of music. And that's what we, that's how we created those sounds. The common thing that Larry and I had was that we loved the club, and we loved roller coasters. We loved roller coasters. Um, you mean an actual roller coaster? Yes. Like a yeah. cycle. No, we used to drive to Coney Island and go on that cycle in 20 times. The, the faith and just leave it up to God and if you fall out, okay, if you don't, you have a great time. Yeah. As a matter of fact, how I really got close to Larry was I knew the Indian in the village people. He uh, used to dance at a bar on 14th Street and 11th Avenue called the Anvil. A piece of paradise. He got his gig in the Village People because the producers of that group used to go to the Anvil and saw him in that costume and said, we're going to make a group, put out our music, and they used all these characters, and that's how they created their, their music. So they were doing a film in California called Can't Stop the Music, and Felipe called me and said, come to California. He said, there's a ticket for you at the airport, come to California. And it was at the time when there was a disco convention, uh, another part of Los Angeles called Center City. And I knew that Larry was going to be out there with Judy Weinstein and a whole mess of DJs from New York. And I, it was just serendipitous that I ended up there at that time. So Felipe had a car, he was on the set, and I took the car and went to the hotel where Larry and Judy were, just to say hello. You know, here I am on the other side of America. What year was this around? Uh, 1980, 81 maybe, yeah. So here I am showing up at that hotel, and Larry says, I'm bored with this shit, let's go. So we went looking for the Beverly Hillbillies mansion. Well, we got lost. We ended up in Laurel Canyon, and Laurel Canyon is this kind of road that eventually there's no more road. It turns into a trail, and here we are in this rental car. There's less road than there is car, and Larry loved that. That's the thrill, the roller coaster. Here we are literally live in a, at the top of this thing. We've got to back down now. There's no way to get out, and we're backing down where the cliff is right there, like half the tires off the cliff. And uh, that's where Larry and I got close, looking for the Beverly Hillbillies mansion. Because we left, we were both heading back to New York the next day, and that next weekend I was at the garage, and I had been going to the garage probably for six months. Um, but I never went to the booth. I just love the club. And the, my way that the way I got into it was I was an organist at a church on 30th Street, New York. And one of the people in my choir 
worked at the garage. So he put me on as his guest one night in 1978, and I fell in love with the place. So I had been going there for a while, but never, you know, made it. Because so many people tried to get close to him for, you know, commercial reasons. Right. Uh, play my record, da 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 You know, nothing was like that. It wasn't like that. It was like, we loved the club. Um, we liked each other. Um, we liked the same kind of music. And that was the how we started. That's how we became close. What was your first thought like when you went up that ramp into this? Um, here, I love this place. This is there, but I love this place. And the thump, thump from the walls, the sound. It was like if you weren't ready when you were at the bottom of the ramp, by the time you got to the top, you were ready for it. And that, the, those days was construction part. I mean, there was scaffolding in the club. It wasn't all done. There was bleachers on the sides. And, uh, there were, you know, it wasn't, the, the club was still a work in progress. I love that club, I love the club. It was just that, I don't know, one, that's one of those things that people who have been fans of the garage to this day, I mean, we had that party uh, last, in the spring or, or late, late winter, and, you know, here's 2,000 people who just love the place. And it was because of the vibe, because of, you know, there was no alcohol, there was no sex, it wasn't like an after, you know, hours club, it wasn't, it was about the music and about the dancing. How about the people? How about the unity? How about, you know, the crowd? Well, that was the, the attractiveness of it. You had real hardcore b-boys from Brooklyn who were hanging around these fairies, and it was all about the music. Uh, nobody was there for any other reason other than the dance. Um, Michelle, who uh, she used to come there with a like a suitcase with costumes, and she would change into these costumes in the bathroom. And at uh, nine o'clock on a Sunday morning, she go back in the bathroom, put on street clothes, and out she would go. And it's like she turned into this butterfly from. <laughs> And that's what people found in that place. They found expression, they found uh, no prejudice, they found nobody looking at them for any other reason other than, yeah, let's have a good time. Did you know Keith Turner? Yeah, sure. He did our album cover. Everything he's done that, that I have of his is all signed. Because I would force him, I'd say, come on, did you sign it? No, I don't want you sign it. Why? Because it's going to be worth something someday. You watch. Uh, <laughs> now he's dead and we're selling for 30 grand. What kind of network of friends would you have seen or that came from the Pirates of Survivors have you interacted with you know, yourself or? Um, uh, David, um, who's a lifelong friend. Um, the woman who uh, was responsible for bringing us to Island Records. Um, she's a close dear friend of mine to this day. Um, I have a great relationship with the Weinstein. Uh, and all those DJs, uh, Danny Crivet, Kenny Carpenter, um, Jimmy Registered. You know, all these guys are, Boy Jarvis, they're all people that I have uh, a camaraderie with because of the club. That in the, from the music end, the other commercial ventures of, you know, the, the place, where, you know, we would say that these designers would come to the club and watch these kids put this shit together, you know, because they were poor, but they still wanted to be interesting looking, so they cut the fingers off gloves and they'd make, you know, brought this to Julian and got Madonna being styled. By somebody who saw somebody at the club. And that's how it worked, you know? The, the next year's fashions are like out in the dance floor. Hmm. But he, um, he was a special person regardless of uh, his education. You know, that, that was, he had an education from just living life. Uh, it's hard being a black kid from Brooklyn trying to break into anything. As time goes on, it became easier. But, um, you know, I mean, Larry was an Episcopal uh, altar boy. You know, he was what? an Episcopalian altar boy. <laughs> In the church? Yeah. When he was like seven, eight years old. Yeah. Or did he have a close network of, with his family or relationships? No, nah, he really didn't talk about them. I mean, I knew his mother. I got to meet his mother. I never met his father. I don't think he really knew his father. He was, uh, that was pretty uncomfortable for him. I still believe that love is the message. I believe in that from the bottom of my heart. That's the common thing that Larry and I have, is that we believe that there shouldn't be any difference between gay or straight, black or white, young or old, rich or poor, people from Earth. He loved the Star Wars saga. He loved the idea of going to space and looking back at the Earth, seeing, oh yeah, that's where we live. Not 
the neighborhoods where we live, not the houses where we live, but that planet, of all of their that's where we live. So he was able to get that far in perspective of what happened here. And we got together every week, and people were out there running around just having a good time to the music. That's his role. He was the modern day Parker in the circus. And he spoke through music. He spoke through uh, the songs, through the records. Like a lot of people, they play house music, there's no vocals. Larry very seldom plays instruments. Always played records with vocals because that's how he got his message out. And we knew from a commercial standpoint, I mean, you can't go into a record store and say, I want to hear this song go da 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 da. I want, I want that song goes heartbeat. That's how you remember the music. You don't remember the music from the music itself, really. You remember it because of the vocals. Well, he played vocals. So all these house DJs who talk shit, you know, da 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 da. You got no message. Well, yeah, the message is, no. You, know, you can, you know, make people bang, bang, bang all night like a drums from Africa. But if you really want to communicate with your audience, on a literal, literal level, you gotta have a vocal. What would you say, um, do you know any monumental songs that Larry liked or enjoyed, or a song that really stuck out you know, in his head, or something that he really gravitated to? Make It Last Forever. Make It Last Forever. That song uh, was our love fest to each other. I look at that song, uh, and it never came out. He, it never got released while he was alive. He played it all the time. Because Larry wasn't a businessman, uh, deadlines weren't important. He could have found a thousand reasons to be late for the record. Well, <laughs> record companies want to use that. Right, right. So this record came out with Jocelyn Brown, and they won this record. And we got paid for it. It was so late that they never put it on the album. So after he died, they finally released it. And I was happy that they did, because it was, it's a tribute to me and him together. I mean, it's a beautiful, if you could hear the original and then see what, what, what the production that we did on the second was amazing. I mean, the solo, the, the keyboard solo alone is like so antithetical to how I think of music. Uh, you know, like keyboard players and guitar players, you know, how fast can you go? Right. How many notes can you put in? On Make It Last Forever, there's like three notes in the solo. Here's the solo. Paradise is there. You hear it. Paradise is there. That's the first note. And he, I'm convinced that he used that. All of this is me. Right there is 100% me. The strings, the bass, the cowbell. Now, when she sings Paradise is there and the solo starts, you can hear her say, you can hear him go. One note. One note. You gotta say no. Just play that note. And for a keyboard player, that's hard, you know? And then you say, okay, yeah, you can do that now. But stay there. I can see him standing right here saying it. When we're in a recording studio, there's all kinds of the, the board, with, you know, shit, 48 tracks, two machines. He loved that stuff. Now, he loved, uh, he never, the first time he edited a piece was in our studio on, on 30th Street. He never cut the tape himself. He always used to make the engineer cut the tape. He spent all night. He started about 11 o'clock at night. I fell asleep on the floor. And at 7 o'clock in the morning when I woke up, he's still there cutting the tape. And there's a pile of tape on the police. I cut it. I did it. I did it. And from that moment on, he never, nobody ever was allowed to cut tape. He, he did the editing himself. He would sit there with the machine, cut it. He loved the technology as well. So the hand clap on Don't Make Me Wait. You never hear that before. I never heard that kind of an effect before, right? So we're sitting there, we're doing the mix. And with a board, you have uh, a place in the board that's called Effect Send. And what you can do is any track on the board can go to one piece of outboard equipment. There'll be a, a, a digital delay, or a compressor, or a phase shifter, or an EQ, or some piece of outboard equipment. So we had one of those sends went to the delay. And all of a sudden, I turned the thing to the hand clap, and that thing that went through, put that, and it was like, crazy. because, if you change one button, you'll never get it back. Right. So we actually printed that right on the tape. He knew enough, he was insightful enough to know that it was so important to print that at that moment, because we'll never find those settings again. That moment, we'll never be able to recreate. So he said, print it. 
So we printed it and that's part of the tape. So you mean the introduction was basically the hand clap that went through an outboard gear Correct. to a set that he edited a tape, a portion, and made that part portion of, of, in the sequence, I guess, before yeah, of the intro of yeah. your record, basically. Yeah, he, he, he made, not only that, but we, he cut it, he would make that the feature. Okay. That's all you heard. The beginning of that record is all you hear is that hand class. Right. So when radio, and we had the stereo, severe stereo panning. So when you're in a car, and this starts da, da, and the other part goes da, 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 on that speaker. So it goes da, 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 da. Literally, that image of the send. Right. In headphones, it's even more dramatic because you, you know, more cool, cool, cool spatial. Yeah, so uh, he loved that. And at the club, he had a stereo field so that where you could be at the club and it was a diagonal stereo field. Mm -hmm. So that when that thing was going, the things would spin right around the room. Wow. And he'd stand in the middle of the room and he'd stand and he goes, right around, just right around your head. You, know, you don't move, let the sound move right around you. Wow. And you get the idea of like, now, now, they have, 7 1, you know, the, the uh, home theaters. Right. They have seven speakers. They have front, rear, left side, and center. So that's seven places for sound to come out. And when you go to a studio to mix, you can put stuff anywhere in that electronic field. That pan is this way, this way, left and right, front and back. So you can place things in several fields. All kind of places, through all down there, up here, and Larry loved that kind of stuff. Loved it to the point where the records were made. I mean, we, when we got an auto panner, he had it. We spent about four thousand dollars on one mix because he rented eight auto panners. Right. But when it's in the room, you're gonna go fast and it's this slow. And I mean, he he loved that kind of stuff. So when you do, you have songs like "Don't Make Me Wait" with that hand clap. People never heard that before. Never heard it. It's like, what is that? Because I noticed when that song first comes up, uh, the hand clap, you know, dominates like the beginning part of the track, and then the vocals come in like a, you know, soulful, dreamy type of, uh, of effect. And the, like the bass line, it just creeps in little by little. It builds up. Was that by design or, you know? Um, there are so many mixes of that, but here's the one, the first one. When you hear that, what is that? Just the clap alone? What the hell is that? Is that a record? What is that? Something wrong? You got them, you got their ears immediately, and then you, right after that, oh my god, every record had a hand. Well, I was gonna say, Chef, Chef mixes down right after that, that starts the sound. And Arthur Baker. And Arthur Chef and Arthur starts it. But that, that right there. Where the fuck did that come from? It's like, wait a minute. How many takes or how many different mixes do you think of that one song that you did before you got it after what you wanted? Well, that's, that, <laughs> there's probably a hundred of them. But, okay, uh, here. Look at right here, there's five reels. Five reels don't make me wait mixes. <laughs> Larry just sitting there doing mixes and printing them as, you know, doing it. And if you listen to some, I'm um, one of the things that with a drum machine, like if you don't program a drum machine, it just keeps playing the same thing over and over and over. A live drummer, I mean, I just had those for a month. These are electronic drums. Oh my god, look what that says. Read that out loud. It says. Sex from Ron St. Germain wants to be friends on Facebook. Ron St. Germain is the engineer for Don't Make Me Wait. You are listening to Legends of the Dance Floor, a piece of paradise. The Larry LeVan Story. 
In this next interview is with DJ Bobby Federighi, who was the resident DJ at Trocadero Transfer in San Francisco. He's going to give you a little tidbit story about Larry Levan and the behind the scenes of what happened when he played at the club. So let's go to his story. I said, Larry, so good to see you. I want to hear you play so much. So Bobby, to be honest with you, I came up from, I was playing at Grove in LA and I wanted to hear what you sounded like and just check out San Francisco because there's Harvey Milk thing that's going on and, and we were having riots. And I said, well, why don't you just come play tomorrow night? I would love it if you play my club. He says, Are you, I can play here? I said, sure, it's my club. I consider this my club, but you don't need permission from DeCalia or anyone. And it was such a luxury having someone else play in my old DJ booth. Larry had such class. He did with his music, you know, a little bumpy at times, but so I, it's the follow up record that, that, that counts. And he would just create such a style or a mood, you know, and just, he's kind of like me. Throw it on and just, he knows, he knows what, how to drive his car and what direction. His mixes were a lot to be desired at times. But we all know that. That's what Larry was famous for. And he lifted up the needle and played MFSB over again, the same whole side of the album. You know, click, 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 click. They hear that song. The crowd's cheering him. I said, my God, he's got made here. But, and then he played it over again. And they roared. They were just so grateful and thankful that the needle was on the record and they would get more music. You know, they were so desperate for Larry and music and they would sound such was so wonderful. It's just like the ears must have been ringing when he we're now. And I was up there, Larry paid no attention, you know, he's just like, oh, oh, God, put the lead up on her. <laughs> just like that, you know, just, what were you saying? <laughs> but when Larry played on the dance floor, all my fans in Trucadero, my followers, they were looking at me, they thought somebody else was taking over the DJ booth and they were trying out a new DJ and they were trying to support me. And they said, who is this guy up there? You know, I said, no, he sounds good. He sounds really good, doesn't he? He's my friend, Larry LeVan from New York. And oh yeah, come to think of it, it does sound pretty good. Yeah, I kind of sort of like it. They all got my permission to be uh, nice to him. <laughs> And they were. You are listening to Legends of the Dance Floor, a piece of paradise. Next up tonight, we are very fortunate to have Brian Chin, as he very nearly left us recently. Thankfully, the Lord doesn't need Brian's encyclopedic mind on dance music just yet. Brian Chin, ex-Billboard dance reporter and all-round good chap, speaks dance music from paradise now. and put it out and gave that song to Tom Moult. They made a 12 inch out of it and it was a million seller for him in, in the time when uh, there was a disco radio station or several competing disco radio stations all of, in, in every city all across America. And those radio stations sold so many records in the years 1978 through 79. By late 79, all of those radio stations and most of the media was running away from disco. By the time Dan Hartman made the song Relight My Fire with Lolita Holloway and Norman Harris doing the orchestrations, he was uh, well aware that uh, there, won't be, there wouldn't be any radio stations that played it. So even putting it out, naming his next album, which he put out in late 1979 after that song was going to be an absolute loser for him commercially but he put it out anyway he was thrilled by the response that it had in the club you know particularly in the uh, spot where uh, Lolita comes out for her verse and it's just uh, one of the all-time peaks of dance music one of the great moments you know that that would get an, a, a reaction from the crowd just make the, the whole song which was nearly 10 minutes as well. Uh, it would really make the whole night as a matter of used to bring special remixes on tape, on reel to reel tape, and he would bring them to the garage, watch the crowd dance when Larry played the tape several times over the month after that record came and went. It was on record for a really long time. It was in nine weeks number one on the national club start. There was no pop radio play on it, so it just it didn't sell. He performed it at the garage with Lolita and that was a moment in itself. You know, of course it was pandemonium when they went through the entire song once, but then they, they uh, sort of linked on and did an encore of the song from the point where Lolita's part comes. You saw the sea of arms reaching out to them, just sort of signifying it, it was one of the great moments of excitement and togetherness that I had ever seen in a dance club. Uh, Dan and Lolita working together. 
the audience uh, singing Rewrite My Fire Lies. When did you see that particular performance? Late 79 or early 1980 it would be because Death of Disco thing was, was already ported. The record companies were already closing down their dance department where they had hired people to promote records, especially to the club and try to cross it to radio. When radio stopped picking up dance records and, and started playing uh, soft, easy listening records, that was the trend of that year. The urban cowboy uh, country politan trend. And that was when Anne Murray and the Oak Ridge Boys and Terry Gibb, Barbara Mandrell had big top 40 hits, but you could have a, a, a nearly million seller by Evelyn King or Yarbrough and people and no pop stations would play it at all. Or, or the Gap Band, I mean, they, they were still getting gold and platinum album the singles. You don't see them when you look them up in the histories of the national pop charts because at that time pop radio would not play most uh, dance and black music. Star Guard wear it out. The sound of, of the garage was first and foremost soulful. It was also uh, really eclectic and because of the quality of the sound it, it just penetrated you on, on, on making the bottom and the base of the record sound really good so that it really penetrated you without being screechy or squealy or burning your ears from the upper frequencies. It just had a tendency to make everything sound deeper and more soulful and, and I think that's why also the musical style of the garage had a tendency to wander toward Jamaican records were mainly concentrated on the drum and the bass that was already established for many many years so the Peach Boys record Don't Make Me Wait was a direct reference to that and that's why my impression hearing it for the first time when it was released on West End was that it really summed up everything in dance music that had ever been innovated up to that time. It was such a forward looking record because it took the most radical part of soulful dance music which was dub reggae and, and put it into a, a an American R&B soulful dance uh, context. Billy Nichols' Give Your Body Up to the Music I think was another one of those really deep grooving records or as radical as Peach Boys but that was one of uh, Larry's first credited remixes. Things like Got the Next Dance by Denise Williams and The Boss by Diana Ross. These, these were things that had a tendency to just sound and feel even deeper than they were when you heard them at the garage because uh, the crowd would get into them so much. The sound system was made records of a really, really deep sort of gut impact that you really felt like in your solar plexus. You also have on the tape uh, there for, uh, for the Grace of God Go I by Machine, a really quintessential garage or New York record because it was made by August Darnell who made a conscious point of writing music that was about the fusion of races, especially when miscegenation is still a topic of controversy in, in our country. He really enjoyed uh, pushing that button and, and plucking people's nerves about it. And, and so when he wrote that song, he was actually trying to make an ironic comment about people who thought it would be safer to live in a, a place where there were no blacks, Jews, or gays. And he was really actually uh, criticizing those people in, in the song, but uh, there were some DJs and radio people who uh, listen to the song probably too fast or think about it uh, from an ironic point of view. Hi, this is Victor Simonelli, and you're listening to Lenny Fontana and Eddie Gordon on Legends of the Dance Floor. Yeah, Boy, this next girl, man, she is amazing. This is Rochelle Fleming. After tracking her down around the globe, we finally got her on a phone conversation, and she opened up to me and went real deep about the anniversary party and everything that went on and her career. I'd like to introduce Rochelle Fleming to the world, and here is her story. You know, for a long time. Oh yeah, and you know what? One record that always stands out. Yeah, he played of yours. Yes. Took my love away. I know. No, I know. We all talk I about any I tell you, me and Tony Humphreys was talking about that not too long ago. Uh, a couple of years ago, I saw Tony, and uh, 
we were talking about, Larry. I'm telling you, every DJ, uh, uh, Louis Vega, every DJ, um, Frankie Knuckles, you know, I mean, it, it, Larry's name comes up. His name comes up. Well, because you know what? Like we all said, he had the Cadillac of Cadillacs. You know, right? Um, you know, your thing is just good, but his is better. Absolutely, you know? that's right. Can you remember the 90th anniversary at all? The second anniversary when you performed, what it was like there? Oh yeah, uh, extremely explosive. In your um, in your recollection, can you like people are gonna be listening to this on the BBC? Can you just give us what a night was that night was like? They don't care if you're sweating. If your makeup is, is, is uh, the gay community is like, they are extremely, extremely supportive. I love them with all my heart. But one thing about New York, everybody parties together. And that's what I love about that, that, that state. Um, Chicago is the same, actually, for, for first choice. Uh, but I tell you, New York is like, when we came out on that stage, it, from the time the first note came out, and I was a little horse, I, I remember now. I was a little horse. I just said, God, you got it. I want to make these people realize that I'm here for them. Just help me to get through the show, do the best show that I can possibly do. And that audience was in, just awesome is, is the word for it. It was like, oh my God, like looking up in the sky at a really dark night and a gazillion stars wow. <laughs> all over the sky and they're brightly shining. That Now that would be exactly what that night was like. Exactly, I can't, and it stays with me, and it has been with me. That's a lot of years ago. Yeah, I know it's a lot of years. That's why I asked you. A lot of years deep. ago, and it still stays with me. Dig deep, wow. That's, I kind of thought that, you gotta realize, at the time when I was recording this, I was a young kid, and I didn't realize what history this was. You know, you have to think about it. You know, Frankie at that afternoon mentioned that, you know, uh, I think it was Friday, he mentioned Saturday night he was gonna be at that Paradise Garage. I mean, I'm a kid. I had no idea what Paradise Garage was. Right. <laughs> you remember, did you, did you ever dance at the dance floor or did you just go there and perform and hang out? Oh no, there was a time um, during our, like after or between shows, we did two shows, I think uh, a couple of times there. And between the two shows, we would come out and dance, mingle with the audience. And we would be on that floor just dancing and having a hey old time. <laughs> It's just such a, it was such a magical, explosive place. I mean, so electrifying. I can't even, I don't know what other words. It's just, it, that, but that particular night was unbelievable. We came on and boom, you know, did it. And it was just fantastic. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I am so jealous. <laughs> I'm so jealous. <laughs> oh wow, I can't even. I just unbelievable. Very, very historical time. Could you imagine if we didn't have that? I know. And and not have WLS and Frankie Crocker at the same time in unison. Exactly. Working together. I mean, Larry was playing the records on Saturday, right. and Monday right. Frankie was playing them. That's right. Whenever I do interviews, you know, like I said, it's it, their names pop pop up, you know, all the time, and um, and I I make no mistake, I, I make sure I, I let people know, you know, I let people know that I am I, I'm extremely humble. I'm a very humble person, very humble, you know, that uh, God has given me the gift to have people in my life like like him or you know the, the Larry the band and, and Frankie. I tell you, I just, uh, they're very missed. I, I was definitely uh, Frankie. I, I don't know where I was when I heard about his passing. I forget now. Yeah, it's tough. That was a tough year. That was, to me, that was an end of an era, you know, when I heard it. Yes, it was. Yes, it, yes, it was. Um, you know, one record for me personally that I love and cherish mm -hmm. of yours is Dr. Love. Yeah. And I tell you, um, Lenny, when I do those songs now, I'm in the same key that I was when I recorded those records. He's got the potion and the motion. That's the same key. Yeah, it is. I feel alone, Dr. Flow. <laughs> work, girl, work it. <laughs> you know, 
You know, very, uh, very blessed. That's all I can say. That is one of our favorite. Well, that's a lot of us in New York and all over the world, for that matter, love Dr. Love and Tom Moulton's long extended mix of it. Ah, uh, Mr. Moulton, really good friend, and and he's working on something now of, of mine, and I'm excited about it, and uh, he's so excited. He's he's another big fan, and it's been a pleasure working with him every time I went in that studio. He just, he said, girl, just do what you do, you know, he would just let me just run my mouth. <laughs> oh, wow. Wow, I thank you so much for a lot of these questions because this this is stuff um I, I I do have interviews but a lot of times they don't you know, they're not you know, as deep as, as this one. Um it has changed. A lot of stuff has changed. You know, but it's good to know though, it's still people there that that it's still an audience out there. It's just you know, it's it, and, and I'm having fun now. I'm having fun and, and that's 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 the best that you can do with your life, you know, because life is very short. Yeah, well, can you can you just say um, a little bit about your, your counterpart, which would be Lolita Holloway, now that I got the tape oh. running, and Sal Soul? Because I'm going to be honest with you. Your group and you are, like, one part of it, integral part, and then there's that other voice, Lolita. Yes. Can you, because right. now that she's not around, can you just, you know, give us a little bit... What if maybe she influenced you, or you know there was something there? She was a powerhouse. We um, we all shared an apartment in New York. Whenever First Choice was in New York, we would stay at this particular apartment. And when Lolita was in New York, she would stay at the same apartment as well. Whenever we were performing there, and uh, Lolita, in the very beginning, by her being such a force, we met her and Grace Jones actually at the same time when we signed the uh, record label with South Soul Records. Lolita, I remember Lolita telling me that I was, a, um, what did she call me, a singing fool? And I said, so are you. <laughs> she said, wouldn't it be nice, Rochelle, if we can do an album together, child, or something together? But we never got the chance to do a, an album together, but we did do background vocals for Will Downey some years ago. Wow. And uh, yeah. And, and that was a lot of fun. I would have to say, yeah, she definitely uh, was more than a friend. I did, I learned a lot from her. Like, the voice was just so huge. Her, her whole presence, she had a huge presence. And my backup singers now, um, when they first met her, they felt the same way. Matter of fact, she used my singers on a lot of her gigs whenever we worked together. She would use her, uh, my, she would say, Rochelle, I'm going to use your singer. Don't worry, I'm going to pay him. I go, all right then. But yeah, she was, I would have to say, yeah, she was definitely, um, she had a, a hand in decisions that I had made. Like she had my back if she heard my voice being sampled overseas and she happened to be gigging over there. At the time, she would give me a holler out, you know, a yell out, let me know. And I would do the same thing for her. So we kept, we got very close like that. And all I can say is that she's going to be just sorely missed. I mean, huge. Could even see the potential of even a bigger career. But, you know, God had a, a bigger nightclub for her to play. Right. You know. And a top billing to come to it. Yep. That's right. You know, there's there's one record in house music that stands out for me with you. How was that? There's no man in the world. No, no man in the world. <laughs> ah, I'm surprised to see a suitcase at the door. That acapella. Oh, yes. That acapella is on more house records than I can count. Yeah, you know. <laughs> I even heard it, your voice even putting reverse. I've heard them all, trust me. Yeah, and you say to yourself, how many more times can they keep sampling this I, record? But you know, it just, yeah, like I say, every time I open my mouth, I say, God, thank you. Because it, it's all him. For me to still be, I mean, for people to still like this. I have a whole new generation of young people, you know, that love those songs. And I, I did the uh, Chosen View, 15,000 people in Chicago last year. And they were young children and they were singing, It's Not Over. They were hollering, um, you treat me right, I'll be good to you. People were singing these, these words, they were young people. It's, it, all I can say is thank you, God, because they, they, it's a whole new generation, the whole new scene. 
Wow, an incredible 60 minutes from the times Larry shared with Manny Lehman, Michael De Benedictus of the Peach Boys, Bobby Vitoriti, Brian Chin, and the amazing Rochelle Fleming from First Choice. Tomorrow, Saturday, we start earlier at 10 p.m. with the Legends of the Dance Floor finale of A Piece of Paradise. Five hours in total, including Lenny and Mike explaining the mystery of the tapes. An interview unearthed in our research that Larry gives in New York. Some very special commentary from DJ Kenny Carpenter of Studio 54 fame. And to close, for the first time in over 30 years, the live broadcast of the Paradise Garage's second anniversary, 1979. Featuring DJ Larry Levan, MC Frankie Crocker, Garage Crowd in Full Voice, and a roof-lifting presentation by Lolita Holloway and Dan Hartman, performing a once-in-a-lifetime rendition of their classic Relight My Fire. Also, the incredible Sylvester, giving a live performance of his huge hit, You Make Me Feel Mighty Real, 10 p.m. to 3 a.m. tomorrow, in full, glorious 70s spectrosonic stereo.